Good evening. You are um, welcome to this live stream virtual town hall with your state lawmakers, Senator Monica Dingra, Representative Larry Springer, and Representative Roger Goodman. My name is Ken and I will be your off-camera moderator for the evening. Tonight's event is an opportunity for your state lawmakers to answer your questions about the 2021 legislative session. We sent out a survey last week to the residents of the 45th Legislative District. We compiled those questions that were sent in, along with other questions that were sent directly to the lawmakers by email and other ways. And tonight, your lawmakers will be answering those questions. You can also submit any questions you have during this live stream in the comment section wherever you're watching. With that, let's get started. I'll turn it over to the lawmakers for opening remarks, starting with Senator Monica Dingra. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. I am looking forward to hearing from all of you. I just want to start off by saying it has been fascinating um, being in a remote session. Uh, we have heard from so many of you. So I really want to thank all of you for um, engaging in our democracy. We're seeing record numbers of people signing in to testify and having their voices heard. So thank you for that. And I'm so looking forward to our conversation. I guess I'll go next. Uh, I, I'm yeah, Roger. I was trying to unmute. It's, I, I don't know. It's the line of the year. <laughs> you're on really. Mute. You're on mute, right? <laughs> so okay, I'll I'll just uh, proceed. I'm Roger Goodman, uh, and one of the two state representatives. Um, in, uh, in the middle of my uh, eighth term now, and we are, uh, I believe, on day 66 of the 105 day uh, legislative session. So a little bit past the halfway point. Uh, it is very intense, as uh, Senator Dinger said, uh, uh, the the ability for people around the state to participate in our democracy has uh, really intensified our workload because uh, because you don't have to travel from one place to another. Uh, we just go from one meeting to another uh, just by clicking on the computer. So uh, our workload has sort of doubled, uh, but that actually gives us an opportunity to get a lot of really important work done. Uh, and actually, Senator Dinger and I uh, are working on many of the same issues. Uh, we talk about 12 or 13 times a day. Uh, she is a, an expert in behavioral health and the criminal justice system. And uh, I serve on the public safety committee. I chair the public safety committee with jurisdiction over our criminal system. And uh, many, many issues we're dealing with uh, this year, particularly uh, police accountability. That's occupying most of my time. Uh, and also sentencing reform. So perhaps we'll get into some of those issues, but it's a pleasure to be here this evening. And good evening. Uh, I'm Larry Springer um, and uh, Roger and I are seatmates, have been for the last uh, 16 years, I think. No, or only 15 years. Only 15 14. years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I, I would also parrot Roger's comments. Uh, this virtual session has changed our lives uh, in ways we never imagined. Um, I have become one with my dining room table, uh, which is where I'm sitting right now, spending 10 to 12 hours a day staring at a computer screen. Uh, uh, it, it is uh, no substitute uh, for the personal interactions you can get in Olympia. But as Roger said, a lot more people have been able to contact us you know, during our committee meetings and whatnot uh, because of, of the uh, remote session. So um, it may have some implications for the kinds of things that we can conduct in the future. We don't know yet, but uh, it just might. Um, I'm in my starting my 18th year um, in the uh, in the legislature um, and uh, or actually 17th year. Technically, um, I am the deputy majority leader uh, for the House Democratic Caucus. And most of my work is uh, focused on uh, the Finance Committee, which is the committee that determines how the state raises money. Um, and the Appropriations Committee, which is the committee that decides how to spend the money the Finance Committee raised. So I'm uh, mostly involved in fiscal matters. So with that, let's maybe move on to some questions. Great, thank you. The first question is from Michael, and the question is about voting rights. Michael asks, how are we ensuring that every eligible voter can register and vote?
You know, I'll just say the year I joined the legislature, it's been three years now, we passed a huge voting rights package. We passed the uh, Washington Voting Rights Act, the Native American Voting Rights Act, same day voter registration, pre-registration for our 16, 17 year olds. We did prepaid uh, ballot postage um, and, you know, did some work on the Disclose Act, which was regarding uh, political donations and having transparency there. So I will say that um, during COVID, our state was so well situated to handle the pandemic, and we've had record turn um, turnout in our election. And so I'm very excited to see that. I think we definitely are a model uh, for the country in ensuring that individuals can um, access their right to vote. So I'm very proud of the work we've done so far. We still have more work to do. And I know there was a, a house a bill in the House that has been sent over to the Senate dealing with restoring uh, felony voting rights. So I'm looking forward um, to uh, voting on that bill in the Senate. Yeah, I think Washington state is distinguished from most of the other states uh, in the country. Uh, many of you probably have seen how 40 or more states are trying to roll back uh, voting rights uh, in the wake of the last election. Uh, but uh, as Senator Dinger said, we are already a, a national leader. We've been conducting um, mail-in, very successful, uh, reliable um, mail-in voting uh, for years with extremely high uh, turnout. I believe that in the in our district, in the 45th district, more than 90% of eligible voters uh, voted in the last election, which is uh, really setting a new record. And we have already passed, uh, already made progress in past legislative sessions to provide uh, much easier voter registration uh, and advanced registration for those who are not even 18 uh, years of age yet. Um, so I, I think we're distinguished from uh, the rest of, there, there is actually a bill that was introduced uh, that would end mail-in voting. Uh, that bill didn't even get a hearing uh, because we're not going to go go backwards. We're we're really um, uh, enhancing democracy more in our state. Thank you. The next question is also was also submitted ahead of time, and it is from Rob. Rob asks, "How is the rollout of the vaccine going to be?" meaning will your primary care providers get to distribute it or will it show up at a pharmacy? And that is one of, of quite a few questions we had about the vaccine rollout. Well, let me take an initial stab at that. Um, the um, I would preface it by saying uh, King County is has the second lowest infection rate in the nation, second only to Honolulu. Uh, so what that tells me is we have been doing the right thing here in King County and for the most part statewide. Um, I, I don't know that I have a clear answer about exactly where vaccines will ultimately end up. Uh, some pharmacies will be doing it. Uh, some schools will be doing it. Um, uh, the uh, Mariner Stadium may be doing it. The Evergreen State Fairgrounds in Monroe uh, are providing it. Uh, but the latest update on who is eligible for vaccines was just updated by the governor's proclamation. Uh, I received it in an email, we all did probably about an hour ago. And if you'll excuse me, I'll just read about four quick lines here. Uh, so these are the people who will currently now be eligible for vaccinations. All high risk critical workers, that's agriculture, fishing, uh, vessel crews, food processing, groceries, corrections, prisons, court laws, public transit, uh, people 16 years or older um, who are pregnant or have a disability that puts them at high risk, anyone 65 years of age and older, anyone 50 years of age and older who lives in a multi-generational household, uh, all workers at risk in healthcare settings, educators and school staff. You heard that a week ago from the governor that teachers now are uh, among those to be edu or, uh, vaccinated. Um, and people who live or work in long-term care facilities. That's a fairly broad expansion of those eligible for the next round of, of vaccination. So hopefully that uh, gives you some confidence that we're trying to get ahead of it. Yeah, we passed uh, an early uh, action bill uh, very, very soon after we convened our session uh, to provide a lot more funding to roll out the vaccines 
uh, as quickly as possible to the point where we hope very soon to be vaccinating about 45,000 people a day. Uh, I do know that in our district, uh, in Redmond, uh, I believe it's on the Microsoft campus, they have a mass vac vaccination site. Uh, and uh, I don't have the specific information about how to, to uh, get a vaccination there, but uh, I believe primary care providers and a farmer, the question is, you know, where can you get it? it? There are many different places you can get the vaccine. Now, it's interesting, it used to be, where can you get a test? Now is where can you get a vaccine? So we're certainly making progress. And I'll just add that you can go to the Department of Health website and they have a phase finder. So you can actually enter your information and they will let you know whether or not you're eligible for a vaccine. And if, and if you're not eligible for a vaccine, you can also sign up for notifications so that you can get a text or an email when you do become eligible. We also have a, a very cool app, which is a vaccine locator app. And um, you can if you can just use it, I'll tell you um, everywhere that a vaccine is available and how to schedule appointments to do that. But definitely do uh, check out the Microsoft um, site and I have more information on how to locate uh, vaccines on my Facebook uh, page as well. Thank you. And we've also, we have some information on the screen right now about the, the website and uh, the, the phone number. Um, so take a look at that before our next question comes up. The next question is our, uh, our, one of our first live questions on Facebook. And uh, I'll add that now. So live on Facebook, this is another Michael who says, my wife and I are definitely senior citizens at this point. What is the state doing to prioritize services for folks like us, especially those with disabilities? So I'll just say that, you know, one of the feedbacks um, that I have been getting, and I'm gonna talk um, in terms of senior citizens and property tax, and um, even those that are disabled, is I had a bill a couple of years ago that uh, made it easier for individuals to qualify to get the senior um, tax exemption. And I have been putting a lot of information out on making sure people can apply for it to find out whether they're eligible. And uh, lots more people are doing that to make sure that they can stay in their home. So I would definitely encourage individuals um, if they're struggling with um, property taxes to make sure they sign up for that deferral uh, process. And I'll just say there are a lot of uh, resources out there, especially now uh, we have community members, other organizations, uh, willing to pick up meals, drop meals, uh, check in on individuals um, who are older because it is very challenging being isolated. And um, I know especially for grandparents, it's been very challenging not to be able to meet their grandchildren. And I've been hearing wonderful stories of those grandparents who got vaccinated and can um, meet with family. So I think there's a lot of collaboration going on with uh, community members and community organizations in really trying to make sure that we're taking care of our seniors and those who are uh, feeling a lot more isolated than normal. In conjunction with that, uh, the Finance Committee um, just passed a bill and then we passed it off the floor of the House uh, recently that uh, would extend to senior citizens who are applying for a property tax uh, deduction or uh, reduction, they have to demonstrate what their income levels are. We have now allowed uh, seniors in that situation to deduct the cost of medical equipment and prescription medicines from their income uh, to help them lower their threshold a bit. And hopefully that will help more qualify for that property tax deduction. So that's a new effort that uh, we just uh, literally passed, I think, uh, last week. So, I mean, in general, you know, our priority in terms of uh, social services is to help the most vulnerable, and that includes children and uh, older adults and those who are disabled. And with the most recent revenue forecast that's come in, uh, we will still have the funds to keep those services flush and, and robust, uh, such as uh, home health care and, um, uh, and uh, day health in uh, senior centers and so forth. Thank you. Our next question is from a constituent, Ross Hunter, who asks, what are you going to do with an extra $3 billion? We should put some away like we did in 2006 to 2007. Uh, 
again, unmute myself, just so everyone knows, uh, the question comes from a former representative from our district, uh, former representative Ross Hunter, who used to chair not only the finance committee, but he also chaired the appropriations committee. Uh, so I won't, I, I won't consider this a loaded question, Ross. So, uh, but thanks, thanks for the question. We are going to receive from the federal stimulus package, uh, the, the state, uh, and I just got this today. So pardon me for referring to some papers here because I haven't had time to absor uh, absorb all of it. Washington State's standing uh, to receive about $7 billion in federal stimulus. Of that, a little over $4 billion will go to state government. The rest goes to local government, cities, counties, school districts. Uh, of that $4 billion, it is um, earmarked uh, or required, you know, split up according to the federal government, about $400 million in rental assistance, $600 million in child care, uh, about $2.5 billion in education related services um, such as higher ed emergency relief um, and uh, uh, some additional business grants. So most of that federal money likely will go out in the in the form of stimulus and grant money to those entities that have really struggled during the, uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, it does lessen the pressure on our operating budget uh, which should allow us to avoid any overt use of our rainy day funds, which in effect allows us to keep more money in reserve. Uh, bear in mind that uh, uh, after the public health uh, crisis began and the economy shut down, uh, the economy sort of cratered and we lost a tremendous amount of revenue. Uh, we just received a briefing today uh, that uh, shows that where we were right before everything happened is where we are again today. So it's almost as if, uh, you know, if we were sort of unconscious for the last year and just woke up, it would have been uh, the, uh, the same as it was a year ago. So it's not necessarily an extra three billion, it's, uh, it's, it's back to where we started, but that does allow us as we put the budget together to keep a lot in reserve and also in, as Larry said, the rainy day fund for extraordinary expenses. And I'll just add that people have really been struggling um, and suffering during this pandemic. Individuals, families, small businesses. And, you know, I always say that I'm so privileged to represent the 45th legislative district. We are the most affluent district in the state, um, but that doesn't mean everyone in our district is affluent. And so we really have to be mindful of those individuals who are um, in danger of losing their, their home, making sure that we are providing rental assistance, making sure we're helping landlords, making sure we are helping um, small businesses. The hospitality industry has been really struggling. And so a lot of the dollars that we're getting from the federal government it's important to remember this is a one-time expenditure. This is not money that's going to be coming on a regular basis. And so it really is, for me, making sure that people are made whole, that we are able to um, help them continue and recover from um, the, uh, the pandemic. And so uh, for me, it really is about making sure that the dollars get into the people who are struggling, making sure schools are whole. Um, and so I think there, uh, it really is about the recovery. Yeah, if there's anything of greatest concern, as far as I'm concerned, it would be housing. Uh, those who haven't been able to pay their rent, uh, and those who uh, own small uh, uh, real estate and haven't been able to pay their mortgage, and childcare. Uh, childcare is uh, really, we really need to support childcare as we come out of this uh, to get the economy rolling again. Uh, but I think more than anything else, the, the, we have a moratorium on evictions now, but when the moratorium is lifted, we are gonna really, we, we don't want a, a crisis of, uh, foreclosure and eviction and maybe homelessness. Um, uh, so we have to provide the necessary support for that transition now. Thank you, that's very timely. We just got some other questions about uh, childcare. Uh, so that, that is, uh, addresses those questions, I think. Um, our next question is from Brian. 
Brian asks, how do we know the status of bills that did not pass their chamber of origin by the cutoff or uh, what uh, it means when there's a, a status update that says no action was taken? Are some of these bills still possibly progressing? Um, the, there's two answers to that. It kind of depends on the bill. Um, if it is a bill that has nothing to do with the state's finances, in other words, it doesn't spend money or it doesn't raise money, um, and it did not pass the house of origin uh, by the cutoff date, that bill then is basically back to the committee uh, where it originated um, and is eligible to be reintroduced again next year. Um, and uh, so all bills that were introduced this year that did not make it are simply carried over uh, to next January. If it is a bill that has not passed out of the House of Origin yet, but does have uh, either raises money or spends money, then it's what we call NTIB, necessary to implement budget. And it is not subject to the cutoff. Uh, so if it's any of, if it's a bill like that, then it could be brought up uh, literally all the way to the last day. Can I just say, I think it's hilarious that we are three individuals, two of us are lawyers, and the non-lawyer started the answer with, it depends, which is a <laughs> typical lawyer answer. So. That's the kind of annoying lawyer answer, yeah. Although, uh, it's an interesting question, though, of the, uh, you know, how do we, how do you know uh, where a bill is uh, in the process? Um, you have greater access to information than ever now. Uh, because of this uh, electronic connection, uh, you can always go to the legislative website, leg.wa.gov, ledge.wa.gov, for, uh, and it's a pretty easy site to navigate to, to look at the status of the wide variety of legislation that's introduced. Um, and so uh, it's interesting that uh, the question in indicates you're already following it and asking us how it works. And, you know, I'll just um, add to that. I. I don't know how many of you know this, but I actually love working with students, the youth. Um, I have a couple of bills every year that are that the ideas are brought to me by the youth. And this year, I got involved with a group of students at the University of Washington, and they're doing a master's program that involves technology. And they were pitching idea, uh, uh, wanting ideas, and so I actually told them. Um, that for their idea, if they wanted to work with the legislature on really creating an app or a web-based program that can make it easier for individuals to track bills, to track stakeholders, to track hearings, and um, basically basically engage with lawmakers on it. And so it's kind of exciting, but these students, that's what they're working on. So hopefully, um, if things go well, and they end up getting A's on their grade, um, they can publish this um, this app or launch it. And I think it's just more about making sure we're creating more access to um, policies and to democracy. And I'll say this is one of the silver uh, linings um, that we found during COVID is that people are a lot more engaged uh, with us being virtual. People are watching us on TVW. They're um, getting involved on Zoom meetings. And uh, so I think there are lots and lots of opportunities to really follow along, but absolutely check out the website, uh, ledge.wa.gov, and there are many ways uh, on interacting with your legislators there. And, and tvw.org, too, one of the finest uh, public access uh, channels in the country. Uh, it's very interesting. In the beginning, when we were uh, convening a session remotely, there was a lot of concern that there'd be this hidden government uh, and all sorts of uh, meetings and uh, discussions behind the scenes. It's exactly the opposite. There's been this leveling uh, of opportunity for everyone to participate in government because it's more transparent than ever. It's all online and visible. Uh, and uh, so, you know, the, the lobbyists, the high paid lobbyists down at the state capitol who used to have the, you know, the chance to, to meet us at the door of the chamber to to uh, ask us for something, they're on watching on video just like everybody else, uh, and so there's really been an equalizing effect to this uh, remote session. And we're going to learn from this. I think as we move forward, it'll be more of a hybrid model anyway. We can have quick meet, quick video meetings instead of waiting for someone to transport themselves from one place to another. 
So we've learned a lot of lessons. Thank you. Uh, we, we're hearing uh, or seeing a little bit more chatter about childcare. So um, if you all would like to add anything more, I know it came up briefly before, but uh, people want to hear a little bit more. Yes, thank you. I definitely want to talk about um, child care. You know, one of the things that we simply have not been talking about enough is the impact that uh, on women and women in the workforce that uh, is a result of COVID. Unfortunately, women are still the primary caregivers um, in our state, and we have seen record number of women having to leave the workforce because they have to care for their children. Uh, so many women are unable to do their work and they've had to make that choice. And, um, you know, the issue really is about affordability and about good quality childcare. Um, we've had bills in the House and the Senate, the Fair Start for Kids, that really are about making sure that we have excellent um, childcare and early learning for our children. And to me, this is such a huge gender issue because uh, I'm very concerned on what it's going to take to get especially women back into the workforce. And, you know, I'm lucky I now have teenagers, but when they were born, my paycheck would, in essence, go to pay for childcare. And I'm fortunate we were surviving on my husband's paycheck. But childcare affordability and good quality um, early learning programs have to be a really huge priority for our state. And I'm really glad that uh, this year we're going to uh, make uh, tremendous strides uh, in this area. Yeah, Monica mentioned the Fair Start for Kids Act, which is a major piece of legislation uh, to bring child care up to the level of not only in terms of availability, affordability, but uh, but uh, accessibility. We, we invest so much in our public schools, and we should, and yet uh, the percentage that we invest in what we call early learning, child care is part of the spectrum of early learning programs, is so little compared to what we invest in our public schools. And the Fair Start for Kids Act will, will finally step up to the plate and make the necessary investments uh, to provide the quality child care. This isn't just daycare watching kids. This is, you know, these are professionals who are, you know, need to be trained in child development. Uh, and and help our children, our young children, uh, begin to learn and, and you know prepare them for, for when they get to school. The other thing is that childcare is a business, and uh, these childcare centers are small businesses and suffered tremendously during the pandemic, digging into their own pockets just to sustain their businesses because there wasn't enough support from the federal government. So we have to step up and help those small businesses uh, and. So it's not just that they're caring for our children, it's their own livelihoods as well. When Thank I go you. out and talk to businesses around the state uh, and talk to them about uh, uh, what they need to recover and what they need for economic development, especially in rural Washington, at the top of the list is availability of childcare. Uh, so it was a bit of surprise that that's what businesses told us they really, really need to get back on their feet. So it's a pretty broad-based support. Thank you. We, we uh, have another question from Facebook from Joanna. And Joanna asks, uh, we have many needs in our state, but hoping road improvements won't be overlooked. Keep Avondale Road and Woodenville on your radar, please. <laughs> So hi, Joanna. I remember you you grew up in Alaska, I believe. It's good to hear from you. Um, so yes, uh, the investments in transportation are essential right now for so many different reasons. Uh, we have literally hundreds of people moving into our area on a daily basis because of the great job opportunities here. Uh, you may know that Amazon is moving kind of out of Seattle and into Bellevue, uh, and we have so many other high-tech opportunities here. So our roads are gonna get clogged, uh, as, particularly as we come out of the pandemic, people are gonna be stuck in traffic again. But we also have to provide more opportunities for bicycle and pedestrian. We have to pay attention to environmental needs. So uh, fish culverts, for instance, to make sure that our streams uh, allow for fish to pass. Um, so we're coming up with a major transportation revenue package uh, this year uh, in order to 
you know, keep keep freight moving to make sure that commuters uh, can uh, get to work on time and reduce their stress. Uh, but there's also job creation. This is exactly the right time to invest in transportation to get our economy moving again. And I'll just say, I um, am really hopeful that even our federal partners will um, do some more work uh, on transportation at the federal level as well, so we can leverage those federal dollars. We have a lot of bridges and freeways and highways um, that are um, in need of improvement. And part of what we put in our um, transportation budget are, is also dealing with our culverts and really making sure that we are taking um, care of our environment. So uh, lots of work to be done there, but it definitely is a stimulus um, plan for recovering from the pandemic. I think the House will be releasing uh, a proposed uh, transportation package in the not too distant future, probably in a, a week or two. It's a $26 billion program over 16 years. Um, and it hits everything from transit to roads uh, to uh, alternative fuel vehicles. You know, all of that uh, is, in, is included in it. So uh, stay tuned. Thank you. Our next question was submitted ahead of time in the survey, and it comes from Lita. Lita asks, uh, what can you do to revisit the six foot rule once our school staff are vaccinated? My kids are struggling. I've lost income this year. Please help me to get my district. Please help me help my district get our kids back in school. So Lita, thank you uh, for that question. As I mentioned, I have teenagers. Um, so we've been, we've been doing remote learning. Um, and this is something actually the governor was asked recently about uh, the six um, feet rule and possibly about changing to a three feet rule. Um, and I think that is definitely something that uh, I know that they're taking a look at. I'll just say that the way we get past all of this is to ensure that people are getting vaccinated. And I know that especially in King County, in the state of Washington, we are seeing uh, people eager to, to get the vaccines. And I think the more people get it, and the more people then talk about getting it so that we are encouraging others to do the same, the more we'll be able to get um, back to normal. But we have been doing so well as a state because we really have been ensuring we have a public health approach to dealing with this pandemic. And we really are, um, ahead in the country when it comes to the manner in which we have dealt with it. So I think we have to just continue following the public health advice. And um, I know the six feet versus the three feet is definitely something that we're in conversations about to see when it would be safe to make that switch. Yeah, Lita, you have uh, identified the major impediment to in-person schooling because teachers are now getting vaccinated uh, and the various plexiglass barriers and mask wearing and so forth is all possible. But depending on the school, many of the schools really don't allow for a six foot distance between the students. Uh, so that's why we would be doing alternative days and not full five day a week, all day uh, for all students. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's, it's possible to reevaluate the six foot rule to make it possible for kids to go to school more. Thank you. Our next question was also submitted in the survey ahead of time, and it is from Michael. Michael asks, what steps are we taking in Washington towards a progressive tax system? What will that look like in the future? I'll begin here. Um, the um, We have uh, arguably, it's probably not even arguably anymore, uh, we have the most regressive tax system in the nation. What that means is that uh, people at the lower income level on the spectrum uh, pay a much higher percentage of their income in taxes than people at the extreme upper end of the income spectrum. Uh, it is not progressive. Uh, and that's because we rely so heavily uh, on the sales tax and the B&O tax. Um, we have been talking about this for years. We all know we have a regressive system. We all know it needs to change. We have been unable to agree politically 
on what those changes should be. And I argue that the reason we have not arrived at a solution is that our approaches over the years have been to just pick at little pieces of the tax code and try to change it rather than the entire tax code all at once. Well, I'm happy to say that whole holistic look at our entire tax system is underway. It was uh, started with legislation two years ago. We're about about halfway through the process. It'll be a three to four year uh, review, look back, analysis of where our revenue comes from and proposals uh, on what our system ought to look like. And then a tra literally a traveling roadshow around the state to share those findings and recommendations with the citizens of Washington state and ask them, what would you rather have? The old system, here it is or the new system, here it is, which one suits you better? And we'll find that out. We're about, I think about a year away from that traveling portion of it. We still have consultants working uh, uh, longitudinal um, contracts uh, to try and analyze our current system um, and uh, see if we can't smooth it out a bit. Uh, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to. Um, this is the first effort, I think, since the code was enacted in the 1930s, that we have actually taken a look at the entire code top to bottom. So that that's underway and I'm hopeful. And I'll just add the Senate, uh, the session did pass a uh, capital gains uh, excise tax bill and sent it over to the House. And that really is an attempt uh, to make sure that we are trying to right side our upside down tax structure. And um, this tax is basically one that is going to impact 9,000 um, individuals in the state of Washington. It is um, a, a tax on profit of above a quarter million dollars a year, and that excludes real estate. So it is extremely narrow um, and really targeted towards the, the wealthiest of the wealthy um, in our state. So that's one attempt in seeing how we can correct some of the inequities in our system. Yeah, as Larry said, the taxes that we rely on uh, are regressive because they depend on consumption, sales taxes, and business and occupation taxes, which are very regressive, for, particularly for small businesses. So it is important for us to enact measures to have the very, very wealthy pay more of the, their fair share. And yet even those taxes uh, don't raise so much compared to the entire budget. So it, I completely agree with Larry. We have to uh, look at the entire structure of our revenue system uh, and restructure it so that it's more fair and more stable uh, and brings in as much or more revenue uh, over time. Uh, a factoid I'll just leave with you. 85% um, of the revenue that goes into our general operating budget, 85% comes from three taxes, uh, property, sales, and B&O. Uh, so it's not a matter of just ending one of them because they're regressive. Uh, we rely too heavily on them. So that's the, that's the hill we're climbing. We have another question that was submitted ahead of time. This one is from Chantel. Chantel asks, what were the reasons that the bill on civil remedies HB 1202 did not pass. And where do you stand on police accountability and the issue of qualified immunity for law enforcement? Well, thank you very much, Chantel, for asking that question. We have a, a very large package of bills that we are moving through the legislature to hold uh, police accountable for misconduct, to uh, improve police community relations, uh, and to uphold the policing profession. We're going to be banning very questionable tactics, uh, raising the threshold for the use of force. Um, and uh, Senator Dinger has a very important bill to require uh, officers to report and to intervene when they see the misconduct of other officers. But the one disappointment is the bill that you mentioned, Chantal, House Bill 1202, which would uh, have created uh, the avenue for uh, those whose constitutional rights were violated by police to bring a suit, to bring a civil action and get money, damages, and attorney's fees. Uh, that bill faced uh, fierce opposition 
from the cities uh, who uh, were going to, they're going to be on the hook and have to pay these judgments. And I say, well, they should be because if they're not ma making sure that their police force is operating properly, uh, they should have to pay. Uh, they should be liable. Uh, so we're still working on this legislation. Remember what we said that a bill that might not have made it through the, the, the process this year is still very much alive uh, for the next year. And so that's still a priority for us. And I'll just add to that, um, that, you know, police accountability has been such an important um, part of what we've been working on this session. And I think by the time session ends, what you will find are bills that are aimed at closing a lot of uh, loopholes that exist in terms of training, um, you know, transferring of jobs, uh, really making sure that we're holding our law enforcement officers to a high ethical standard. And I will say that the vast majority of um, officers are good ethical officers trying to do the right things. We have to make sure we are giving them the tools and enabling them to uh, do that work while holding those officers who don't um, live up to those high standards to account for their behavior. And um, so there's a big component around training, around accountability, again, uh, uh, around uh, transparency, around making sure we're doing independent investigations, making sure we have an audit system so that um, when we pass all these rules, that there is someone who is basically making sure that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. So there's more work to be done, but um, I think by the end of this session, it will be a session that we can look back on and be proud of the work that has gone in. Yeah, our work on improving the policing profession and protecting the public has been very collaborative. Uh, the, uh, I speak m multiple times a day with the police groups uh, who are at the table and staying at the table and amenable to reform, they don't want uh, those few police officers who engage in misconduct to ruin it for everybody. They know that there are officers who shouldn't be in the profession. Uh, and so it's a balanced proposal uh, that we're putting forward and, and bringing the police and the community together in the process. I'm only going to tip my hat to my seatmate, Roger, who has led this effort on behalf of the House and and uh, and Senator Dingra. Both of them have been integrally involved in that. So uh, and they are doing great work. Our next question um, was also sent in ahead of time in the survey from Michael, and he asks or he, he says, um, I was pleased to see that property tax exemptions were indexed to the county median income. Because my wife and I are facing her future with Alzheimer's, we will likely exhaust our savings for her care. Can we change the income and asset qualifications for Medicaid as well to index income and asset qualifications to the county cost of living? You know, and I, there's a bill, and I think it's still in the Senate. I'm not sure it was a House bill, which um, actually does allow for individuals to take their uh, medical expenses and um, use them in order to get to the um, the exemption and uh, calculate that as one of those expenses. Um, and so I actually think that is going to be huge because we do know that people end up spending so much money on uh, medical uh, expenses, especially as, as we age. Um, both my grandmothers passed away at 95, and so I know my husband worries a lot about um, longevity and how we're going to um, finance as we get older. So I think making sure that we are allowing for uh, medical expenses to be calculated when determining whether someone qualifies for um, a senior property tax exemption, uh, you know, is definitely another step in the right direction. I just want to say hi to Michael, uh, and uh, next time after this public health crisis is over, I'm going to come visit you in Sammamish. It's good to hear from you. And uh, as a member of the Finance Committee, I can tell you that every single year, senior citizen property tax deductions uh, are introduced as bills and come before the Finance Committee. Uh, so there's never a shortage of ideas. Some of them work out and some of them don't. Uh, so I'm sure we're going to continue seeing more uh, especially given 
uh, the price of housing here, particularly in our district, that is driving property tax as well. So. Thank you. Our next question is another live question from Facebook from Greg. The Blake decision offers Washington an unprecedented opportunity to lead the country in substantially reforming a criminal justice system in which drug possession laws unequally target people of color. Do you intend to support meaningful reform rather than allowing the legislature to merely patch up the existing laws and perpetuate community destroying mass incarceration? Well, I don't know who's going to go first because Monk, Monk and I uh, are are sort of uh, we're stepping on each other to uh, to make progress in this. I'll go, I'll let you go first. Oh, thank you, Roger. I'll just say, by the way, I am glad they're going to handle this because I they can take care of this, and I'll just sit back and listen. <laughs> you know, um, Roger and I really do spend a lot of our days working together, and. This is another one of these uh, issues. And so for those of you who may not know this, um, our Supreme Court recently ruled that our drug possession case is uh, statute is unconstitutional. What this means is that, um, frankly, every single person who has been convicted of drug possession since uh, 1971, their conviction now has to be vacated. And um, so the question really arises, how do we move forward? Uh, we have a lot of work to do in uh, vacating these convictions, taking a look at resentencing, taking a look at legal financial obligations and the burden on our counties and our courts is, is, is very profound. And so we're trying to figure out how to navigate that. We also have to make a decision on how do we move forward from this? And I'll say that our state made the decision to really start focus having a public health approach to dealing with substance use disorder, the minute we decided to start funding drug courts about nearly 30 years ago. And since then, that's where our state has been progressing. Um, we have invested in therapeutic courts. We have invested in crisis stabilization units. We have invested in secure um, withdrawal management units. We have law enforcement diversion programs. We have, you know, you, you name it. And we are trying to find so many different ways for individuals to seek treatment and to seek help that is not through law enforcement. And so moving forward, I think we have to make sure that our laws reflect that reality. Um, you know, I've been in the legislature only for three years. But in those three years, because I chair the Behavioral Health Subcommittee, we've had a lot of bills around um, opioid use. We've had lots of bills around behavioral health issues. And every single time when people talk to me, even when we have discussions on the floor, it doesn't matter what side on the political spectrum you're on. People will always say how they want resources and help for their loved one. They want that neighbor. They want that neighbor's kid to get into treatment. They want to learn how to save lives. Not once has someone ever stood up and said, I told my neighbor to call 911 because their son was committing a felony. Not once. Because that understanding is there that this is a, is a public health crisis and we have to respond with a public health approach. And so I think we, this is really where I, I think people need to put politics aside and really take a look at how we're going to help people. And what does the science tell us on the best way to handle this crisis? And it really is making sure that we are providing treatment for those individuals who need that treatment. The, um, this last year, uh, one of the other things I spent a lot of my time doing is having monthly meetings from people all across the state to take a look at how we are dealing with civil commitment because of substance use disorder. And we had funded two uh, facilities uh, through the state on secure management, with, um, withdrawal management. And so we got um, we got information from them on how they were doing. And they told us that they had a success rate of 95%. That means people who went into their facilities voluntarily stayed and completed and they were successful 95%. I thought it was going to be 60, 70. I was blown away. And the more you look at data, what it tells you is when you make treatment available, people use it. 
they want to get better, they want to change their lifestyle. And so I think we really have a moment in time where we are taking a look at the data, we're taking a look at the science, and we are doing and moving forward um, with what we've already started doing, is having a public health approach to dealing with substance use disorder. Yeah, where the state Supreme Court has invalidated the drug possession statute, they've created a, a vacuum uh, that we need to fill. Uh, Monka has been appointed by the majority leader of the Senate to head the effort in the Senate. The Speaker of the House has appointed me to head the effort in the House, and we're working very collaboratively. I do have to say that it's not just been a, a public health disaster, but a civil rights disaster as well. If ever there were an area of law that had the most egregiously adverse effect on people of color and the poor, it has been this so-called war on drugs. The, the, our drug policies have resulted in everything bad, increased drug use, increased drug-related crime, increased overdoses and deaths, uh, the clogging of the courts, compromising of medical care. Uh, we really need not to make the mistakes of the past and move forward in an innovative way, uh, paying attention to public safety and particularly protecting our youth, but also a sharp focus on social equity and racial equity. And uh, Monk and I are leading this effort uh, to have the most progressive and humane and effective drug policy in the country. Thank you. We have a question also from Facebook from Pat who asks, what are the systems for determining, I'm sorry, that's the wrong question. We had two Pats who asked questions. Yeah. One asked a question much earlier. We can, we can answer the policing question too. So uh, okay. I'll just, go ahead. I'll, I just, I didn't want to I'll comment briefly. So there is a bill that's coming before my committee for a markup or for amendments tomorrow uh, related to decertifying police officers, those who are engaged in egregious misconduct or patterns of repeated misconduct. And they're still out there. They're moving from department to department. Again, this is a minority of police officers, but they ruin it for everybody. We want to be able to give the state a much stronger authority to decertify or take the license away from an officer who clearly shouldn't be in the profession. Uh, and that bill is going to be moving through my committee tomorrow. And this uh, also gets around this problem of the uh, police union contracts. Uh, which allow the police to continue working because they challenge getting fired and they get rehired uh, and they're still on the job to everyone's frustration. So we need this, the state's uh, strengthened authority to take the license away as we have the state's strong authority to take the license away from a nurse or a teacher or even a hairdresser. Uh, those uh, licensing requirements are even more strict now than for policing and that's unacceptable. Thank you for that. And I found the question. It may be the same Pat who asked both questions, but um, a different topic. Uh, Pat asks, what is being done to support affordable housing for those on a fixed income? I'll, uh, I'll start with this one. Um, the state has a somewhat limited role in what we can effectively do to affect housing uh, pricing. Uh, mostly that is a land use and supply issue. Uh, our, we use our tax policy uh, to incentivize uh, housing development uh, that is targeted to people with lower incomes. A couple of examples that are happening right here in our district. Uh, Rogers in my hometown at the moment, uh, Kirkland, Washington is, uh, my wife being the mayor, so I had to plug the town, um, is working with the Department of Transportation to see if we can't convert park and ride lots in Kirkland uh, into housing uh, by donating the land to a developer who would then in turn build and return several of the units, a, a sufficient number of the units, to be held affordable for people at certain income levels uh, for the next 50 years. Uh, so that's a that's an example of the state using tax policy or land use policy to help that. Uh, we also uh, put a several billion dollars a year in our capital budget into the housing trust fund, 
which is then allocated through grant processes to nonprofit housing builders, mostly uh, uh, multifamily. We have extended that now to Habitat for Humanity, who has moved from just single family development to multifamily development. Uh, the, the, really the, large, the, the largest issue there is finding the appropriate land use regulations at the local city and county level. Um, and we need to support our local governments as they make those really tough land use decisions uh, to site multifamily housing. So it's a multi-pronged approach um, and, uh, and we'll continue doing that. We've got a lot of agencies, uh, one of which is, uh, uh, was headed up by one of my former LAs, uh, who is a very strong housing advocate now working for King County. Um, so uh, I can't escape the question, even if I wanted to. So. Thank you. And uh, our last question, as we're running uh, towards the end of our time here, the last question is from Gail. And Gail asks, family businesses are hurting right now. What are you doing to help? Um, you know what, I'll just start on this, and I'm sure Larry has a lot more to add on this. You know, we've done a lot of work with the federal dollars we got all last year to push them out towards um, small businesses and making sure that uh, we are providing them just just finances uh, in order to um, to survive. And there is more work that is going to be um, happening with the new um new dollars coming in from the federal government. I know we're taking a look at unemployment insurance claims and what that looks like. Um, and uh, it's something that I'll say that both um, the House and the Senate really want to make sure that we are um, helping uh, family businesses with. When the pandemic broke, and we went into shutdown. Um, I was tasked by our uh, by the speaker to lead the House Democratic Caucus business recovery team. And we spent many weeks working with the governor's office to try and target um, relief efforts uh, at the smallest businesses in Washington, the ones that were really struggling. Uh, the way we did that um, was to send the Department of Commerce out and and provide uh, seven to eight thousand dollar grants direct grants um, to businesses uh, for them to to use either for mortgage for uh, for payroll uh, for uh, ppes whatever they thought they needed most in order to survive we also convinced um, the the governor's office in our in collaboration with them that in some parts of the state retail small retailers did not need to be shut down um, the if you are a locksmith here's the here was the in the inherent inequity uh, fred meyer was considered an essential service and it was it's a grocery store you needed that but fred meyer also sells locks and, and makes keys but if you were a locksmith in chewila washington you were shut down, but how come Fred Meyer can still make keys? So we said, this is a matter of fairness. Can you let these small businesses open with home delivery, curbside service, reducing the number of people in the store? That worked a lot uh, in, the early, in the early stages. More recently, we just passed the bill off the floor of the house earlier this uh, in January that will give a property tax deferral uh, for any business who could demonstrate a 25% loss of revenue year over year, they will get a property tax deferral for a year uh, in order to set up a payment plan. Um, the federal, that, that was part of the $2.2 billion that we, that we sent out in the way of business relief and community relief in, in January. Um, so it, we're, not, we're not slowing down, there will be more money coming in the federal stimulus, so uh, lots more to do. Thank you. That's all the time we, we have this evening. And thanks to everyone uh, who's watching and submitting questions and engaging with your legislature. If we didn't get to your question tonight, and there were a lot of good questions that we didn't get to because of time, uh, you can reach out to your lawmakers. Their contact information will be on the screen in, in just a minute.
And uh, before we go, a special thank you to Anne and to Mike for helping with ASL interpretation tonight. And also to the staff helping the technology run. It's really behind the scenes. With that, I'll turn it back over to the lawmakers for closing, brief closing remarks. Why don't you go first, Larry? All right, we'll go in reverse order, although you'll still be in the middle, Roger. <laughs> okay, I'm still in the middle. Uh, again, uh, thanks a lot, folks, for, for joining us tonight. Um, while we would dearly like to see you face-to-face -face in Olympia uh, or in the local coffee shop here back in district, um, this is uh, a, a slightly more sterile environment but it has the advantage of a lot more people being able to contact us. Um, and we cannot do our job uh, without hearing from you. Um, so we really appreciate the degree to which you're willing to engage with us. Uh, it helps us do our job uh, and we really do wanna hear from you. So thanks so much for taking time tonight. Yeah, thank you. The uh, range of questions that we received and, and uh, addressed this evening uh, was very helpful to us. It's a reflection of what the concerns are in the community. Uh, and so we will do more of these town halls. Uh, I think we're going to do a telephone town hall uh, coming up as well. Uh, but yeah, it's critical that you're in touch with us either through this medium uh, or through email, although we each receive about 30,000, and we're not kidding, 30,000 emails a year. So it's kind of hard to respond meaningfully to that. But a phone call, and then when this public health crisis finally lifts, and it looks like we're, we've got light at the end of the tunnel now, uh, uh, personal meetings are always the very best. Uh, so we're looking forward to engaging with you. And I'll just echo what uh, both my seatmates have said. Um, thank you so much for participating. And, you know, democracy is not um, a spectator sport. It is a team sport. And um, each and every one of us has to get involved. So thank you for participating. It truly is such an honor and a privilege to represent all of you in Olympia. Uh, there were some great questions and comments. I was trying to uh, scroll through the comments uh, as they were coming. And I just want people to know that as chair of the Behavioral Health Subcommittee, uh, taking a look at special needs kids, taking a look at what's going on with behavioral health is a huge priority and continues to be so. And uh, the 988 bill that was referenced in the comments, that did pass the House floor today. And I'm very eager to um, work on it as it comes to the Senate. That and so many other bills are still in play. So please make sure you reach out, have your voices heard. And our offices are always there to help you if you need anything. Thank you. Thanks for joining us tonight.